Hi everyone, I'm Amy and I'm the Fundraising and Relationship Officer at Hope for Justice. For those of you who don't know, Hope for Justice is a global charity that was founded in the UK in 2008 to combat modern slavery and change lives. I've been at Hope for Justice for just over a year now and during that time, every single day, I've learned so much more about the facts of modern slavery. Before joining Hope for Justice, I, like most people, had no real clue that slavery was even a thing that existed today. I'd actually studied history at a university and for me, slavery was historical. It ended in 1833, almost 200 years ago. So when I joined Hope for Justice and I found out that slavery didn't actually end, but it evolved, it suddenly blew open this whole world for me that I realised that I needed to get involved with and I needed to do something to change. Which is why I'm always so excited when I'm given the opportunity to share what I've learned at Hope for Justice with wonderful people like yourselves. Because we know at Hope for Justice that no one person can end slavery, but together we can. So I always like to start off these talks just by seeing what you already know. Because like you said, I had no clue about modern slavery and I don't really expect anyone else does either. So I'm going to ask you a few questions and then I'm going to give you an opportunity just to pause the video so you can discuss either in your groups or think about it alone about what you think your answer might be. So the first question that I want to ask you is, how many people do you think are estimated to be trapped in modern slavery worldwide right now? Do you think it's roughly 25.3 million people or do you think it's 40.3 million people? So the answer is actually 40.3 million people. That's how many people we estimate to be trapped in slavery right this second. When I first heard the statistic 40.3 million, it couldn't even really register in my mind. I had never seen or heard of 40.3 million of anything, as I'm sure most people haven't. So it was only when someone told me that that's actually more than the entire population of Canada that it suddenly all clicked into place for me and I realised how big of an issue this actually is. Knowing that there's 40.3 million people trapped in slavery now, roughly how much profit in illegal trafficking do you think is generated a year? Do you think that it's $100 billion a year or do you think that it's $150 billion a year? So just take the time now to discuss with your groups or think and we'll be back in a second. So the answer is actually $150 billion a year is made from human trafficking. So when we think about the fact that traffickers are profiting off of the suffering of their victims, those who are forced to do work without pay, often forced to live in terrible housing conditions, not given adequate access to medical care or sometimes even food, it really goes to show how awful of a crime this is and that we need to do something to stop it. The third question that I want to ask you is, do you think that you need to cross some kind of border to be considered a victim of human trafficking? So simple this one, it's either going to be a yes or a no. So just take the time now just to think about it. So the answer is actually no, you don't need to cross any borders whatsoever to be considered a victim of human trafficking. And the reason that I asked you that question is because a lot of the time people tend to think as, of trafficking as something that happens far away. It's only when someone travels from one country to another. But in actuality, um, last year alone, the majority of those identified formally in the UK were actually British citizens. And the way that we like to put it at Hope for Justice is if you imagine that you have a really long corridor in a hotel, for example, and you have someone moving from this room on this side of the corridor, across that corridor over to this room, across that short space, someone can be trafficked. It really is that easy. Now that I've spoken to you just a little bit about the ideas that you have about modern slavery, I do just want to chat about what modern slavery actually looks like. So for those of you who don't know, there's five different recognised types of modern slavery and at Hope for Justice we specialise in four of those. So that is forced labour, domestic servitude, sexual exploitation and forced marriage. 
Forced labour is the most common type of modern slavery around the world in the UK and it's the most common type that we deal with at Hope for Justice as well. Forced labour is kind of what it sounds like on the tin. It's when an individual is forced to do a job for little to no pay. Oftentimes, when people think about forced labour, they conjure up images of people working in car washes and people working in nail bars. And not to say that it doesn't happen in those spaces, but we also see it in really legitimate jobs as well. For example, we see it quite often in factories and those people are working jobs next to other people who aren't victims of slavery at all. It's simply that a trafficker has gotten them that job, set up the bank account for the money for that job to go into, but then the trafficker is the one that's in control of that bank account. So the survivor sees absolutely none of that money or very little of it. Oftentimes they're forced into houses of multiple occupancy that aren't really fit to be living in. And they're sometimes deprived of basic necessities such as food and medical care. The second type of slavery that we see at Hope for Justice is domestic servitude. Um, so domestic servitude is when an individual is forced to do um, all of the sort of manual labour that you would think of in a household. So whether that is doing the cooking, the cleaning, sometimes it's looking after children or doing the shopping even. That is everything that that individual is forced to do often again for little pay. When I first heard about domestic servitude, again, it didn't really resonate for me the first time I heard about it. It was really hard for me to imagine someone in that situation. But then I was told the story of Ofanime. Ofanime had actually come to the UK when he was 12 years old from Nigeria. His parents, family, friends had promised to bring him over, let him live with them so that he could go to the UK schools and he'd get a better education here, or at least that's what they thought. But unfortunately, when Ofanime arrived in the UK, the couple wouldn't let him leave the house. He wasn't allowed to go to school like he was promised. He was actually forced to sleep on a strip of foam in a hallway of the couple's house. Where he went in the house was restricted, what he ate was restricted, who he spoke to was restricted. Absolutely everything about his life was controlled. Um, he was unfortunately in that situation for 24 years. So for 24 years, often Ime's life was completely not his own. His teenage years and the majority of his adult life was spent living in that house under his traffickers control. He actually only managed to make it out of that situation because the couple had traveled back to Nigeria for Christmas one year and they'd left him alone in the house. When he was alone, he actually heard about Hope for Justice on the radio and from there, he managed to make it to a computer and he actually emailed us. From there, we got in touch with the London Metropolitan Police, which was where this was happening in a very suburban and normal area of London. And we went to the house with some Hope for Justice staff and the police to talk to Ofanime and remove him. But one of the things that really struck me about this story was that when we tried to speak to Ofanime and we went to go into the living room just to sit down and have a conversation, he was too afraid to even step foot into the living room despite the fact that we were there with trusted people like police officers and members of Hope for Justice, he thought that he would be punished just for going into the living room. And that just goes to show the mental shackles that traffickers have over their victims. The other thing that I mentioned just slightly earlier was that this was happening in a really suburban area. The people around him, the next door neighbors, really had no suspicions at all. They thought that the couple was just looking after this individual. And the third and final thing that I found most shocking about this case was that one of the traffickers was actually a doctor working for the NHS. So every single day he would go to work with vulnerable people and be considered an upstanding member of his community. And then he would come home to offer Nime who he was keeping as a domestic slave. The third type of modern slavery that we deal with at Hope for Justice is sexual exploitation. So sexual exploitation is when an individual is forced to do sex acts for the profit of their trafficker um, completely against their will. For the majority of sexual exploitation cases, it does actually affect women. And 71% of all cases of modern slavery are affecting women. Third and finally, the last type of slavery that we deal with at Hope for Justice is forced marriage. 
So forced marriage should not be confused with arranged marriage. They're two very different things. But forced marriage is when one individual is in no way consenting to that marriage or they're a child, in which case they cannot consent. And unfortunately, 25% of all victims of slavery are actually children. But that's why we exist. At Hope for Justice, we exist to end slavery and change lives. And we're doing that by taking a four-pronged holistic approach. So we're working to prevent exploitation before it can even happen. We're working to rescue victims, help them to restore their lives and reform society so that one day we're not needed at all and slavery is definitely a thing of the past. At the moment, we're currently doing that in around 30 plus locations on five different continents, um, all the way from the UK to Norway, the US, Uganda, Ethiopia. I won't bore you with the full list. Um, and the approach that we take in each place varies slightly differently. So for example, in the UK, we prioritise more the rescue and restore, whereas in places in the global south, for example, Uganda and Ethiopia, we focus a little bit more heavily on the prevention aspect as well as the rescue and restore. And everywhere we work to reform society because we know that's the only way that we can ever end slavery. I do just now want to talk to you a little bit about one specific person that we helped quite recently in the UK because we can talk about those statistics all day long but it's really important that we, re we remember the people behind the numbers. The woman I want to talk to you about, her name is Elise and she was 50 years old when we first encountered her. Elise had actually been trafficked from Eastern Europe to the UK um, under the premise of her being given paid work in the UK. Unfortunately, when she arrived here, she was given a job in a factory, but she did not receive any income from the job that she was doing. She was also living with her traffickers and became a domestic servant in the house. She was in that situation for three months when luckily police actually raided the factory that she was working at and that's how she was identified. From there, she was referred to Hope for Justice, who helped her to rebuild a life. But the thing is about rescue is that it is not an event, it is a process. Because there are so many different complex issues that come into play when someone's been removed from a situation of slavery, which is why we have an absolutely incredible advocacy team here in the UK. Our advocacy team has individuals called IMSAs, which is Independent Modern Slavery Advocates, and you can see why we call them IMSAs for short. And they are people with legal and social care backgrounds who are able to help survivors navigate the social world, world that they come out into once they've escaped slavery. In Elise's case, she was really struggling to find stability and in specific, a job after she left slavery. And there were a few different reasons for that. For her, English wasn't her first language and she really struggled to write in English. So one of the things our IMSAs did was get her enrolled into English tuition lessons, which meant that she was able to fill out those job applications easier. She was able to communicate in interviews easier as well. Another thing that really affected Elise was that she um, was still struggling with immigration issues. So she'd come over to the UK but was at risk of being sent back to her country of origin. At Hope for Justice, we are not immigration specialists, but we do work with a, true f a few trusted lawyers um, in the immigration sector. And we were able to find one of these for Elise, go to her meetings with her to offer that support, and then also help her to find information that she needed to build up her immigration case so that she could stay in the UK. We also helped her to enrol in college. She actually ended up doing English lessons at college and she actually got tech lessons at college as well. So she learned how to use social media there. Again, a really useful thing for her trying to find a job and rebuild her life, even just to connect with the people around her as well. Another couple of things that we did was we provided Elise with trauma counseling to help her work through what had happened to her. And finally, we ended up getting her a placement with the Brighter Futures um, organisation. And from that placement, that work placement, she actually managed to get a full time job. So now Elise is working full time. She has safe and stable accommodation and a safe income and she can really begin to rebuild her life. And these are just a few of the issues that affect survivors once they leave slavery. There are so many more issues that our advocacy team work to combat. 
Um, for example, we've seen it before where those who were trapped in slavery, their traffickers will actually build in debts under their name. So because they're operating their bank accounts, they can use those bank accounts and they have their IDs to take out loans to pay off bills for the house. We've seen it before where someone had a water bill of over £2,000 under their name that was chasing them after they left slavery. And it was up to them to try and tell the bailiff, look, this wasn't me. I don't owe this money. But because their name was on that bill, they were the ones being chased. We helped that individual to write off that debt um, through our work with the advocacy team who taught the people chasing them for the debt. Other things, like I said, immigration issues are really big that we have to help them to navigate. Um, also, if you think about it, getting access to identification. You really need your ID to move about freely in the world nowadays. And if you come from a different country, maybe you don't have your ID with you anymore. It's figuring out how you get access to that so that you can then move on with your life as well. And that's everything that the advocacy team does, which to be honest, is just a small snippet. You'll see a slide on the screen that tells you a little bit more about absolutely everything that they do and how it all interlinks. But in the UK, we also have some really fantastic people who are community outreach specialists working at our hubs. They work to prevent exploitation before it can happen by working with local communities and finding people that might be vulnerable to exploitation and educating them on what to look out for and what to do if they spot the signs. In other places that aren't in the UK, uh, for example, in the Global South, like Ethiopia and Uganda, we have places called lighthouses. And lighthouses are short term residential centres where survivors of slavery who are children, because we work with children in those areas, can actually come live and recover from their experiences. There we help them to get an education, um, whether that is a traditional um, academic education or whether that is a vocational training so that they can go on to get a job. And we also help them to be reunited with their families where possible as well because that's all, always our goal. We always want to get children back to as normal of a family setting as possible. In places like Ethiopia and Uganda as well, we also have absolutely amazing community prevention um, works that go on. So one of those things that I really love is that we have these women's self-help groups where the women can come together and they can all put a little bit of money into a pot and they can create one big saving pot. What this allows them to do is then when they need money for any emergency that comes up or maybe they even want to start a business they can approach the group and they can ask can i have a loan of this money and the group gets to vote yes or no from there if they say yes they're given the money and then a tiny bit of interest is put onto that but it's nowhere near the amount of interest that a loan shark would put onto it and that in itself is the prevention tactic because a lot of children and women that we see in these places end up being trafficked because they've taken out a loan with a loan shark. Loan sharks will make sure that there is no way that they could ever actually pay off the debt that they owe them so that they can eventually turn around and say, well, if you can't pay, then you need to send someone to work off your debt, whether that's the woman that took out the loan or whether it's a child of theirs as well. And the idea behind these groups is that it makes sure that that can no longer happen to these women and their families, but rather they can begin to thrive and set up their own business and become economically independent. Because poverty is one of the biggest driving factors we see leading to modern slavery today. We also work to reform society because as I said earlier, we want to create a world that is free from slavery. But in order to do that, we have to change the systems that actually allow slavery to thrive right now. So a few of the ways that we do this is working with businesses. So for example, we have an absolutely wonderful training team who make sure that they can go out, they can approach businesses, sometimes it's GPs, anyone that might work with a vulnerable person or come into contact with slavery in their supply chains. And they train them on how to spot the signs of slavery and what to do to avoid it and what to do if they spot it. We also have a social enterprise company called Slave Free Alliance that was set up by Hope for Justice about three years ago now and they work directly with businesses to help them look at their supply chains, see where their weaknesses are and help them to make sure that they don't allow slavery to slip in. 
And what this does is it makes sure that we are creating a society that is against slavery, that is actively working against slavery, because otherwise slavery will continue to thrive if no one does anything about it. You might be thinking, that's great, that's what Hope for Justice does to end slavery, but what can I do to end slavery? And there's some really simple and easy things that you can do. First and foremost, use your voice. Your voice is 100% free and as I said earlier, most people don't actually know that modern slavery exists. So just by you going home and telling one other person that slavery exists, you can help us to end it. The second thing that you can do is learn to spot the signs. As I mentioned earlier, we train people on how to spot the signs and if you're interested in getting formal training, you can reach out to us. Um, or if you know any businesses that could do with that training, please do refer them to us. Otherwise though, if you're interested in just seeing a few little things that you can look out for, we have a whole list of them on our website and I really encourage all of you to just go give it a little bit of a browse and see because slavery is a lot closer than we think. There are 136,000 people estimated to be living in slavery in the UK today. It could be someone that works in a shop near you, it could be someone that you pass on the street and you just don't know. But by looking for the signs, you could be the difference between them continuing to live in slavery and then being able to be removed from that and going on to live a life of freedom. Finally, you can support Hope for Justice and there are so many different ways that you can get in involved with Hope for Justice if you'd like to. We have hubs based around the country and if you want to find out if there's a hub close to you, please do get in touch with us.